Okay, we are in John 7. <laughs> and let's pray and we'll start. Father, we thank you so much for your word. What a delight for you to give us these things in which there are mysteries hidden, some things that we can't even know until now because the world is at the place that it is right now and all of a sudden things become clear. I thank you, Lord, that that we are in this place where we understand these things and other people were just scratching their head wondering, what does that mean? Maybe it was a misprint, um, but it's not. And we thank you, Lord, that you protected your word and that it is before us now as, as, a, um, as just a guide on how to live and how to relate to you. And we thank you, God, that you gave it to us. As we dive in today, Lord, Holy Spirit, teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> okay, we are rocking up, and we are now on John 7. My daughter goes, have you ever made it through a book? In, in one <laughs> I said, yeah, first John. <laughs> I think I made it through James as well, uh, the short books, you know, but and some of the books in the Old Testament that we've gone through have been shorter, but when you come to a book that is so much in it, I don't want to speed through it. I want to take my time and and I want you to get as much as I can give you, which is not as much as is there. There's a whole lot there that I'm not giving you. Um, most I give you most of what I know, which is um, what it is. But there are some things that are hidden and not ready for now, but, or um, I just haven't seen them yet. Anyway, so this is John chapter 7. We're going to um, start with the first verse. And after this, Jesus went about Galilee. He would not go in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. The translation of that is not really good. The translation is the Judeans were seeking to kill him. We'll see that there's a difference between the Judeans or the Jews and then the other people that are also Jewish. But it's the leadership of the, um, of the Jews that were seeking to kill him. Um, now the Feast of Booths, Jews' Feast of Booths, was at hand. So um, the Feast of Booths is one of the feasts, uh, one of the what eight feasts in, in Israel, three of which, if you were 20 years old, and, and if you were male <clears throat> and 20 years old or older, you were required to go up to those feasts three times a year. Feast of Booths was one of them. It's the feast when they build the Sukkot. Have you been, if you've been watching The Chosen, when when he builds that huge sukkah for them, and that's Feast of Booths, and they live in that for a week, we would, we would, it's almost like camping in your backyard, okay? So what you do is you build a booth out in your backyard, or you do it in your front yard. Everybody does it in Israel, and they live in that. They don't live in their house. They live in that to be reminded that they were wanderers in the wilderness for 40 years, and God provided for them. He is the God who provides. And that's what you remember during the Feast of Booths. All of the, the, all of the um, feasts have some sort of thing that, that you teach that are, the people are taught, but it's also the best way to teach children. They always do these big things. They're not going, you're not going to the, to the temple anymore, you, or to the, to the synagogue. All of the, most of the feasts are, um, are handled in the home. And so you're teaching the children, this is what we did. This is who we are. This is what, what happened. This is how God provided. This is how God did during this time. And it's a way for them to walk through scripture. And cool, but, but anyway, so... Um, the Feast of Booths was at hand. So his brothers, these are truly the brothers of Jesus. They are the, the biological brothers of Jesus. This is not brothers, I'm writing to you because of this and this and this. That, that's not. This is Jesus' brothers. Said to him, leave here now 
and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing for no one works in secret if he seeks to be only to be known openly if you do these things show yourself to the world for not even his brothers believed him so these are the brothers of Jesus who did not believe in him at all i'm wondering i don't know it's not here i'm wondering if one of those was james james became the head of the church after Jesus died, and it was Jesus' brother. But we don't know which brothers they are. Anyway, so they are um, um, they are saying to him, why don't you go, go up to Ju- Judea? Well, they know why. Jesus, and we'll see it in just a minute, um, Jesus was being threatened. They were seeking to kill him. They were seeking to destroy him and... Uh, they were looking for him, actively looking for him to arrest him, and um, so he was being he was being careful. Um, not only his brothers uh, believed in him; they said, "Go public! Why don't you go public? Why don't you go out?" Because they were upset at Jesus. I don't know why. They weren't trying to protect him. No, like no, 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 no. Evil as my siblings are, because they don't know Jesus. I would think that they would try and protect me. No, it's more like, it's more like Joseph's brothers mm-hmm. trying to, you know. Oh. Yeah. This is yeah. his son, though. But like, they're his younger brothers, right? Yeah. And they would have to be. Uh huh. Unless, yeah. Yeah. Because if they were Joseph's, they would be fucked. Right. Just you got it. Just no, that's good. Just go ahead and do it out loud. That's good. That works. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. I do it all the time. So, um, for even his brothers did not de- de- believe in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. Your time is always here. In other words, you're supposed to be here. You're supposed to live here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify it, about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going to this up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. So he he's saying he's not he's not going to go up to Jerusalem. But he does. He does. He says I'm not going up. And the schools of thought there's two kinds of things. One is that he said he wasn't going to go up and he ended up doing that. Um was he hiding? Probably not. It's just the idea more, the, the one that I believe more is that he was obeying the father. The father was going, not yet, stay back. Not yet, stay back. But he had to go up because he was sinless. And it would have been breaking the law to not go because he's over 20. And so he did go up, but he went up secretly. So That makes sense. So we always depend on God to do what he says to do. And so Jesus was depending on God. In fact, he says, the things I do, the Father's telling me to do. The things I do, the Father's showing me to do. Jesus never broke the law. And it's really important to remember that. He never, we talked about that last week, I think. Um, he never broke the law when he said, or two weeks ago, whatever, when he said to the to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and walk. And the Pharisee said, that's breaking the law. It wasn't breaking the law. The law said you couldn't carry, meaning you couldn't do business. You couldn't carry product from one place to another. You couldn't bring product into the, into the city or into your shop or, you know, that's what it's talking about. Yes. Well, that's yes. And it's very clear in scripture that that's what it is. But they made it, they took it and they made it super religious. You're not supposed to carry. Well, what does that mean? I'm looking at that going, I don't carry my baby. I mean, you don't carry your son and your daughter. What is, what? We don't, and so what is, what is that? And so what they go to the frivolous, to the craziness, not to the intent of what God had said, which is don't do business, rest, just rest. You have no rest if you don't carry your baby <laughs> because as, as Chad knows, that baby is going to get upset. <laughs> then you really don't have rest, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't really rest. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. So um, anyway, so verse 10 says, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, he went up to, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? So that Jews right there is the Judeans, not the Jewish people, the Judeans, the um, not the people that, the yes, not the people that he's, you know, um, preaching to, that he's healing, that he's, you know, all of those things, not the ones that are following him, but the, rather the, um, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, those that are, um, really into especially living out the rules and the laws of the elders. We'll see that in just a minute, too. This is a new concept to me, that, um, and I'll explain it in a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, Jesus had to go up to fulfill the law, but needed to be wise as to the timing and also wise as to how. How many of us have walked through those very same things? I know I need to do this, or I think I should do this, but how? If I do it this way, this will be a bad thing. If I do it this way, we've been caught in those kinds of things. How do I do this? So in those times, it's just important to just go, okay, God, one step at a time, you tell me how to do this, because I really don't know how to do this without getting into big trouble, however it is. Okay. My, not publicly, but when he got there, there was a time of, of, of public, of public a ministry in the temple. We'll see that in just a second. Um, verse 12, and there was much muttering about him among the people. Those are the Jews. Got the Jews? Those are the people. And you've got the Judeans, the, the leaders. Well, some of them said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for the fear of the Jews, no one see how much of a... Uh, uh, influence the Jewish leaders had over the people. So the Judeans were seeking to kill him, and we're seeing that there are people that are not Judean, Judeans but Jewish people, so there's two separate groups, at least two. Um, okay, this is a seven-day festival. I said that before. For a week, you live in this Sukkot, this um booth that you build outside your house. And as you're building it, your kids are going to help you. You're kind of camping, you know, it's camping in your backyard. And um, and and your kids are helping you do it. You're talking to them about the wilderness. You're talking about manna that you ate that that we got every morning, you know, and this, these are stories that are passed down from person to person to person. Because if you think about it, you've got over a million people who are in the wilderness for 40 years, their clothes didn't wear out. This is just miraculous. Yeah, and their shoes. clothes didn't wear out. Their <laughs> shoes didn't wear out in 40 years. I mean, my shoes might last a while, but not that long, you know, <laughs> 40 years. And and every morning you're fed. Every morning you've got, yeah, manna. And are you forgetting how to plant crops? I mean, I, there's whole, all, all these things. That you just kind of wonder. This whole generation, every morning they get up, they get manna. I mean, you take it for granted, which is there's some good things about that. God is always going to, we should do that. We should take for granted that God will always provide for us, you know. And they, every day, they're getting water, they're getting manna. They're getting tired of manna, maybe, but I'll tell you, I don't know what manna was like, but according to the Bible, it refers to it as the bread of heaven, it refers to it as manna, and and also when the prophet ate the manna that the angel gave them, he ran races, <laughs> you know, didn't have to eat for a long time, so it it's very sustaining, and it meets our needs it's it's amazing stuff i don't know what it tastes like so the manna was only like a specific time of the day i don't think it was like no it was in the morning they found just it just morning uh-huh just morning so if you're lazy morning, like a, like a snow. no I, it, they found it on the ground don't know if it fell from heaven uh -huh. but it, they found it on the ground like a specific place everywhere everywhere, everywhere that they were so when they wake up in the morning, the manna was there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Except on Sabbath. Yeah. Now, except on Sabbath, so that's the six days. Sabbath. Now, Sabbath, got to remember now, you haven't been to Mount Sinai yet. We haven't received the Ten Commandments. We haven't re received any command to keep the Sabbath at all. It's just thrown into everything. On God created the heavens and the earth, six days, seventh day he rested. That's when Sabbath was established, Genesis chapter 1. So we see it again and again and again and again. And they're, they're saying in, in, the, um, in the Ten Commandments, he says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, to keep it set apart, to keep it um, holy. Now, I don't know, I probably said this here, but I've kept Sabbath now for about two and a half years. And at first it was... Uh, I mean, I'll just tell you quickly my metaphor morphosis of this whole thing. Um, what happened was I was teaching this Bible study. We were teaching the Ten Commandments. And all of a sudden I'm going, wait a minute. Why don't we do this one? Why? You know, and I, so I started doing the research on it and, and biblical research. Uh, also men of God, women of God who spoke about the Sabbath. And, and I was convicted and I thought I got to start keeping a Sabbath. So I started keeping Sabbath. And um, and it was amazing what happened. Six days you show you labor and do all your work on the seventh day you rest, right? So I tried to rest on the seventh. Oh, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. All my little piles of things and all my little things that I need to do in my to-do list, calling my name all day long was like, ah, and I so wanted to whatever. And I've, and I've walked past that messy desk for days, you know, but for weeks, for months. But on Sabbath, all of a sudden, I'm going, I want to clean that desk. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What in the world? That was my first thing. When I finally got over that, God helped me. When I finally got over that, it was, um, I started getting emergency calls. Oh, Jan, I really need you. I really need to come to counsel. I really need your prayer. I really need to to do this. And so I would, I would answer that call. And then I, every, every Saturday this happened. I mean, it wasn't Saturday. Every Sabbath it was happening. Maybe it was Saturday. I don't remember when it was. I think he tried to do it on, um, I don't remember. It doesn't yeah, matter. Saturday. Yeah. Did I? No, okay. No, you were on Friday, right? Right. Yeah. I can't do it on Sunday. Sunday's a normal day to do it, but I work on Sunday, work a lot. So anyway, so, um, so you're like, Lord, why are these things always happening? I said, is this, is this, should I do this or not? I'm, I'm wondering, you know, these, these emergencies. And um, so then I remember that Jesus said, well, if your donkey is in a ditch, you would get it out, right? So now I have to go, okay, God, is this a donkey in the ditch? No offense. <laughs> if you've ever called me on Sabbath, no offense at all. <laughs> but is, is, is this a donkey in the ditch, you know? And sometimes it was yes, you need to, and sometimes it was no. And I'd say, "Well, can I meet with you on Monday?" Oh, sure. Yeah, it was never no. It was never any problem. But when they started talking to me, it was like, "I need to talk to you today. I need to talk to you an hour. Can I, you know, can I come to your house? You know, whatever." And so, so it was like, okay, we'll meet on Monday. So then I solved that problem. Now. What my challenge is, is to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Is my Sabbath glorifying to God? Do I enthrone Jesus in Sabbath? Do I glorify him? I'm getting better at it. Let's put it that way. I am so not perfect at those at these things at all. Marriage is a little different. Jesus is our Sabbath. Yes. Isn't this respect? He fulfills every aspect of the law. Yes, he does. The Old Testament says, thou shalt not murder. Jesus took it further. Don't even be angry with your brother. Right. Thou shalt not commit adultery. He takes it further. Don't even look. Right. And when it comes to the Sabbath, he takes it further. Every day is our Sabbath rest. I am the Sabbath rest. Right. Under me. I rest through all those. It's the same thing as mm -hmm. you. And I think you have it down. In, and we all have different 
right. opinions, all different churches, but but it's okay. But holiness, yes, dedicated to God, mm -hmm. you know. And actually, truth be told, Saturday really is a Sabbath. Sunday is the first day of the week, right? The Christians, right? The true Sabbath day is is <laughs> Sunday to Sunday on Saturday. There's That's a verse in, the, in there that talks about the um, the Sabbath was made for man. Yes. Not man for the Sabbath, yeah. <laughs> which meant, which means that you should not be a slave to Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Sabbath should be a, it's, it is the blessing of God. It is situated to bless you. And if we remember that it's supposed to be a blessing, not an onus, not a burden, not something, oh no, it's Sabbath. It should be, oh yay, it's Sabbath. And um, if there are people who want to keep a Sabbath, I especially... This age right here with children, John Mark Comer, John Mark Comer has a really good um, podcast on, on keeping Sabbath with children because he has young kids and his kids love Sabbath, you know, it's like, and so he's done it right, you know, because they love Sabbath. It's not like, oh no, Sabbath, I can't do anything, you know, it's, it's, it, he, they love it. And, but for People my age, the the better one is um, is Robert Morris's on on Sabbath because he really does a very good job on on laying it down um, what it is and and how um, how to do it. I don't know it. Your own convictions is like I just told you my journey. It didn't. My journey did not start with oh I've got to keep this day holy. It's <laughs> Started with, I'm not going to work today, you know, and I'm going to, and what I found is that when I rested on Saturday, on Sabbath, what happened is I took that rest, that peace, that deep down joy into the rest of the week and every day became a Sabbath, but it, yeah. but it didn't come without that seed of, of truly setting my part, myself apart for God. So. Anyway, I wasn't intending on talking about this habit today, but but it is um, there is um, a thing that God that Jesus is completing the law, but He's also holding to the law. He does not break the law; He's sinless. And this is a seven day festival. The first day begin is begins with the holy convocation. That's day one, and but they're supposed to do the normal things. They're supposed to even work on during this feast. It's not a seven seven days of Sabbath. It's there is a Sabbath in there, and that Sabbath, wherever it falls, is part of that week. Um, so anyway, okay. In the middle of the feast, Jesus. So in the middle of the feast, not the first day of convocation, but he went up to the temple and did what he does: teach. That's what Jesus does: is he teaches. He went into the temple now. Pretty easy to hide. You've got the tallies, if you know what that is. That's that blue prayer shawl that they that all the men wear. And then they have a beard. So thick picture all the tallies and the beards. It's it's feast time, you know, and so they're all there going into the temple. So Jesus was not um really being, you know, not able to really pinpoint who he is, but he stands up in the middle of the temple and begins to teach. And the Jews marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he's never studied? Now, I never knew what that meant. Oh, gosh. How is it that this man has learning, has understanding of vocabulary? It's, that's what the, the literal meaning of that is, understanding of vocabulary. Now, if you're a rabbi, you write letters this is really cool. You write letters to all the people who follow you. Well, guess what Paul did? He's rabbi. He wrote letters to people who followed him. Thank God we have the Bible because of it, right? And so you have, so it's not out of the box to do what Paul did, to do what, what Peter did, to do what, what John did, to write letters to people. And these people in the middle of this had all these people from all these different sects who are writing letters to the people who are following him. Now the Jews marveled and said, 
How is it that this man has learning when he's never studied? Jesus is teaching underscored some of the things that these other used some of the same vocabulary, but brought it to truth. Adjusted it. And they were going, wait a minute, how's he doing this? Because he's doing it using vocabulary from several different rabbis, from several different sects. This is, no wonder they, otherwise, they, why would they marvel? I mean, it was, an, okay, he's a good teacher. That's, that's not the marveling part. The marveling part is that he knew they didn't all. Have Google back then. <laughs> right. They didn't have Google back then. <laughs> it's exactly right. They didn't have Google then. How could they? How could he find out all this stuff? And they were many of them were secret, secret letters and all of this. So many of them were secret, and yet he was teaching all of these things, putting them all together, and correcting some of the things that were wrong with some of the teachings that were that were purported. So there, so of course they marveled. How did they know that? How, you know, it's almost like, how did they know this? How did he know the secret handshake? You know, <laughs> how did he know all of these things that you, we only know because we're part of the club, you know, but how did he know this? And he's never studied. So he's never found out all of these things. This finally made sense to me because I thought that doesn't even make sense. Why would they be so surprised that that Jesus knows scripture. All the, all the Jewish men over 12 knew scripture, knew wide swaths of scripture, probably more scripture than most of us know. They knew whole books of scripture. <laughs> Again, if you've seen The Chosen, you see it, all of a sudden they break out together in, in, in quoting mm -hmm. scripture. I know you guys like The, the Chosen. Have you seen the movie? It was full. It, it was on a Monday. Monday. Monday night. It, I cried. I laughed. Mm -hmm. it's season three, the first two episodes oh, are in the theater. They'll be coming out soon to the app. Yeah, they will. He couldn't wait. <laughs> he went and bought tickets. Well, there's that, and I like supporting. Yes. What I see. Yes. So. And it was full on a Monday. I was really. That would be too yeah, late to like really watch it with uh, some. Hollywood records. Yeah. Well, and the cool thing about that, they don't get it. They just don't get it. They think, oh, we should do more religious things. And then their religious things fall flat and yeah. don't make money at all because they're not scriptural. We don't like that. You know? So, no, this good. yeah. Anyway, how did Jesus know these things? Because he was untaught. Um, Okay. Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. So what Jesus is really saying here is it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus had the Holy Spirit. What Jesus did was he came as the Messiah, yes. And he came to save us from sin, yes. And he came to be the blood sacrifice for us, absolutely. But he also came to show us how to live. These things you'll do because I go to the Father. He came to show us how to live. Uh, you can live because, and I always thought when I was a kid, because you got to remember, I was raised Baptist, and so I'm going, yeah, but this isn't really fair. We're supposed to live like Jesus, and, you know, and, and, and he's God. How can we do that? You know, that's not fair. But that's not what Jesus did. He came, I explained this to you before, he came as a son of man. He came with man's abilities, but he lived through the power of God. He put that aside. When he put it aside, he really did put it aside. He didn't just say, oh, well, I'll draw on that bank account if I need it. But he really did put it aside. He really did live as a human, he really was hungry. He really was tempted. He really was all of those things, but not without, but without sin. So here he is living out the way that we should live. How should we live? He's, he's the paragon. He's the one that we, we copy. He's the one that's living according to, according to the things of God. He doesn't sin. He Everything that's crooked, he straightens out and says, well, wait a minute. 
we're really not talking about picking up our mat on the Sabbath. We're really not talking about that. So he's straightening out things that are people are going, eh. I mean, it's like, how is Eve tempted? She saw that the fruit was good and that it was good for food. And the snake said, has, has God said? And she says, oh, yeah, we're not supposed to eat it. We're not even supposed to touch it. So what did she do? She went to the religious part, right? So she's going, we're not even supposed to touch it. That is not what, she, that is not what God said. He didn't say anything about not touching it. But she took it to the, to the next place. Oh, we're not even supposed to touch it. Now, being fair to Eve, God said that to Adam. Adam said it to Eve. Maybe Adam said, you're not supposed to touch it. I don't know. But the point is, as human beings, we take it to the next step and say, well, I probably shouldn't even do that. So it's important for us, I believe, to live like Jesus did through the power of the Holy Spirit, listening to what he says, listening to how he says it, and obeying it. And I believe that if we do that, and we are in error, that the Holy Spirit will be the one that corrects us. And I have been, I've been corrected by the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't, I'd like to, um, I'd like you to pray with me tomorrow, afterwards, because I really need your strength. Anyway, anyone desires to do God's will, there's promise attached to this that, um, that he will teach you into truth. The Holy Spirit will lead into truth. So there's a continuation of the connection with Genesis. Um, if uh, Verse 17, if anyone is to do God's will, he will know whether he's teaching from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So, Jesus lived to the glory of God, which is what, even though he was God, he didn't take that position of God where he would have to be worshipped, where he would have to be obeyed and honored and glorified. He put that all aside. And he, he um, came in the authority of God, which set, sought to glorify him. We need to do the same thing. We need to live to glorify God. As we glorify God, then we are in the place where we hear from the Holy Spirit better. You know, it's all a matter of really hard for God to lead us if our motivation is pride. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> it's really hard for God to lead us. And if we have a problem with being led by God, my question is, have you checked out between you and the Holy Spirit? your pride level. I don't know that. In talking with you, I don't know that. Sometimes I do, but most of the time I don't know that. That's between you and God. But if we're if we're standing in pride, it's difficult to obey God. Because we're seeking our own glory. Okay, so in Genesis where it says that we are made in the image of God, that is an image that reflects God. And so we're back to reflecting God. Jesus said, I am pointing to God. I am pointing to the one who sent me. In me, there's no falsehood. I'm pointing to him. So this is what he's, this is what he's saying. He is, he is saying some hard things. Last week I said, Jesus is beginning to say some hard things, and he's going to say some hard things for the next few chapters. He's saying some hard things. Last week we went through, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part in me. That's a hard thing to say. It says in the scripture, some of his disciples stopped following him then. I might have been one of those. I, I don't know. That was really hard to hear. I know I'm on this side of the cross. I understand he's talking about <laughs> communion. I understand he is the Lamb of God. And he is the sacrifice, and the sacrifice was eaten. And I understand all of those things, but I don't know that I would have connected the dots. I don't know. But anyway, so there are some things that he's saying that are really difficult. 
Um, okay. Jesus does not violate the truth of God. Unrighteousness does not um, does not exist in Jesus. When there's pride and glorifying Himself, it's an invitation to the enemy. So in the, in our own lives, if there's pride and there's a glorification of ourselves, then that's an that's an invitation to the enemy. So the leaders have come to the temple to get some dirt on him, to try and kill him. And Jesus is talking to the leaders and he tells them that they're not obeying the law. But the rules of the elders, that's what they're obeying is the rules of the elders. And that is something I don't know that I ever saw before studying John, is that that was what Jesus was saying. You're, you're not obeying Moses' law. And they didn't have, they didn't come back and say, yes, we are at all. They knew they were obeying the elders' laws because they thought that they were more specific than their deeper truth. Mm -hmm. They're more important. They're the next level. If you were mature like we were, you would not just do Moses' law, but you'd do the laws of the elders too. That's their, that's their attitude. So, I mean, even in Matthew, we'll hear him say, why do you forsake the commandments of God for the traditions of man? That's what he means. Why do you, why do you forsake the commandments of God for the traditions of man? It's the laws of the elders. Um, they were accusing him of wrong teaching. They were removed from the law of Moses into the law of the elders. So has Moses, has not Moses given you the law? Mm -hmm. Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd answers, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? You've got a problem. You know, nobody's seeking to kill you. Nobody looks like they're seeking to kill you. But Jesus knew that that's exactly what was happening. Um, Jesus answered, I did one work and you all marvel at it. What was the one work? Take up your bed and, and fall and take up your bed and walk. That's, that's the one work. And you're all surprised. You're all surprised that I did it. Healed the crippled, crippled man on the Sabbath. Told him to take up his bed and walk, which was, in their mind, breaking the Sabbath. It wasn't, but didn't like the authority. Didn't fit with the elder's teaching. It's a proper deed because of the law of Moses. So, <laughs> let's go to verse 22. Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it's from Moses, but it's from the Father. Again, circumcision is very much like the Sabbath. It was way before the law. Way before. Because this is part of Abraham. It's not a part of Moses. This is Abraham who... Moses almost got killed, right? Because he wasn't. Yeah, because his son wasn't oh, circumcised. Was yeah. <laughs> right. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a mess. <laughs> So in verse 22, we see that circumcision is not originating from the law of Moses, but from the law, from Abraham, not the law of Abraham, but from Abraham. So he says, Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. So if eight days after you're born, if you're a male, you're circumcised eight days after you're born. Eight days after you're born. Uh, interesting. Vitamin K is the highest and eight days after you're born. So blood clotting is great. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> She's the nurse, so I wait. <laughs> so I didn't do babies, so yeah, I didn't do babies. <laughs> well, they give them a vitamin K shot now, which That's is true. kind of interesting. Um, instead of waiting for the eighth day. But um, eighth day, regardless. Uh, you're going to be circumcised on the Sabbath, even though that would be work to them. Okay, so his point is, you circumcise a, a child on the Sabbath. So if, this, if if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so the law of Moses may, be, may not be broken, you're angry with me because on the Sabbath I've made a whole man's body whole. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment now the interesting thing is the sabbath is set apart for spiritual healing it's a covenant relationship 
it's not receive, not removing the foreskin, but it's a spiritual healing. So healing moved in his life, being a lifestyle pleasing to God. So Sabbath is restoration. After reading the Torah on Sabbath, there is prayer for healing the sick. I love that. That is so cool. So on Sabbath, right after Sabbath, right after the Sabbath reading, they pray for the healing of the sick. And yet he's healing on the sick and he, they get upset with him. Mm-hmm. Isn't that crazy? They're not even, they don't even see how that doesn't even fit. So that's what he's trying to say right here is that, okay. Are you angry with me? Because on the Sabbath, I made a man's body whole. That doesn't make any sense. Don't judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Judge with right judgment. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Questions? And do you feel like you've been run over by a tra- tra- train? <laughs> Sorry, some of you are going, uh... <laughs> well, you, also, you said like the, the body and blood of Christ. Thing. We missed that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't know after years and years of being Catholic, I guess they really do believe that the Eucharist turns in yes. to the body yes. and blood. Yes, um, Catholics believe that. Yeah. Transubstantiation. Yes. Yeah. The Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I did not know that. So, well, they believe that as the priest prays over the bread, that it becomes the actual. Yeah, it's a miracle. Or he's yeah. Doing He's doing a miracle or something. It actually turns into the body. And- Which, if there is communion elements left over, poses a really big problem. What do you do with that? And they have a whole thing that they do. That they do, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So that's called transubstantiation. And, and um, that's not what we believe Although we believe it's a symbol, it's a symbol, yeah. But, but actually, I believe it, I believe there's a place spiritually where it goes beyond symbolic, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. same as baptism. Baptism isn't just a symbol, in the same way as my wedding ring is not a symbol, there's way more to that, there's way more to baptism, there was way more to all of these things. I mean, a symbol seems to be minimizing. And I don't think yeah. that that's, right. I think that's the problem that I have with, with that terminology. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, it's, um, it is a hard thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you eat the body and blood, you have no part in me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why they do it. I think that's where they get that transubstantiation too, mm-hmm. as well. They need to eat the actual body and blood of Jesus. So we're going to have to pray over it, make a miraculous change. Yeah water into wine and I mean I can see where they would get it but I think they're in error so when I got saved I had to unlearn a lot of teachings that I've taught the Lord told me he says Mark but you're and believe what my word says or you believe what you're taught each time I had to make a decision what you believe God or I knew what the what the church taught me and thankfully I, I, I believe the Lord. And it's, every time I made the right decision, just like a week to step off. Mm. But I was down up in, you know, in, in, um, <laughs> I never knew until I got saved and started reading the Bible and understanding it. Mm-hmm. And when well, we went up to church, went to crossroads, you know, mm-hmm. learning, you know, with everything. But it was, it was, God dealt with me in that way before, you know, before it go on with him because there's certain things that were, of believing that wrong, they're hindering me. Mm-hmm. They dealt with me in a really neat way. Well, I think we make, you know, Jesus said, I mean, one of my favorite quotes that he says is, you do err not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. Yeah. Two big ways we make mistakes, you're not knowing the scriptures. And he says that to Pharisees who are not believing the scriptures, they're going after the, the, the code of the elders. So you make mistakes if you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And um, in my life, the errors that are were made in my life, especially before I came to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was the power of God. 
got the scriptures down. I memorized them. I was, you know, knew all the stuff because because we really studied the Bible. <laughs> but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is just fun. Uh, 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 uh. And so that was the way that we made. So when you have the scriptures and the power of God, so that's the beauty of churches that are few and far between, unfortunately, but places like like City Harvest, where there is a an emphasis on the scriptures and there's an emphasis on the power of God. The great balance. And you can find yourself leaning one way or the other and having the Holy Spirit correct you a little bit, you know. Yeah. Correction of, of God is beautiful. So I think one thing that really like uh, hung me up for a long time was I thought I had to figure these things out by myself. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize like God was going to teach me. Mm-hmm. And even now I can get like upset. Of, like, like I'll hear from God and I need to be in this stance. And I'm like, I don't know how to get there. And I'll get really upset. And it's like, I don't have to figure it out. He yes. Me. He teaches you. He gets you there. Yeah. If he tells you you have to get there, then he's going to tell you how to get there. <laughs> I don't know why, it's just one of my big things. Yeah. I guess I don't believe. Well, I'm not, I don't know about that. I think that, that, I think that, that when you hear God tell you something, that you should know how to do it already. And (laughs) just because God tells you to do something doesn't mean you know anything about how to do it. When you accept Christ, like the, the word of like like God's law is written written on your heart, right? That's what it says. And uh, even I think like even I think I can I, if I'm doctrinally wrong, I'm stop. But even before like you come to Christ, to some extent, like there's something in you that kind of knows. Yeah. You know. And so for me, it's like it's the drawing of the Holy Spirit. The things that I did then that I wouldn't do now. I always knew that in theory I shouldn't do. It's just now I have somebody like tangible that I have a relationship with to be accountable to. You know? Yeah. It's like you know. That's good. Jeff. Don't do anything you wouldn't do. Like with your grandma was in the room. He's like, <laughs> my grandma. He's like always in the room. So I have to do that all the time. Another name of God that I've never known. Jesus is my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand what you're saying, though. It's just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, it's like you know what you need to do theoretically, but if you don't have hope and you don't have the God given strength, like it's just, it's not possible. Like, you know, Bill Shiver said, it's like, you know, if, if you think you've heard from God and He's asking you to do something, you can do on your own, but then you didn't hear from God because He's going to tell you to do something that you That's can't. That's good for do. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because He wants to show His power in you. Yeah, That's so, good. Right, and it's cool because you really do learn about Him and who He is, and and it's, it's incredible. I'm glad that that's how He does it. But I didn't like for the longest time. It just well, and the frustration of that of thinking that you should know how to do it already puts that big blockade between you and God. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, instead of him teaching you, you think, I'm supposed to know how to do this. And I'm feeling really condemned. Yeah. He's the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He relates to it by teaching it. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. <coughs> I'm going to stop this.